Welcome to Season 1, Episode 3 of Beyond the Zero. I'm your host, Ben. Joining me today is writer and critic Dustin Illingworth. Dustin's work appears in the Paris Review, the NYRB, the New Yorker, and many other publications. He's one of my absolute favorite critics. Thanks for joining us, Dustin. Thank you for having me. So first of all, how did you get into writing literary essays and criticism? Well, um, I studied English literature in in college, so I was always um, very interested in the subject. I was always a voracious reader, although it did take me quite a bit of time to actually um, I suppose, feel comfortable or confident enough to um, get my thoughts down on paper and begin submitting them um, as essays. Uh, I came into it fairly late. Um, my first essays were published in my early 30s. Um, so it was, you know, a matter of submitting to some of the smaller, but I think still very excellent venues out there, like like Full Stop, for instance, um, the Quarterly Conversation, which is no longer, sadly, no longer um, up. Um, 3 a.m. magazine and others who were willing to take on someone who had no bylines uh, to their name um, and, you know, began submitting essays. And it was very much a, a process of grinding it out. And I, I had, I definitely had a sense of getting better over time. And that was incredibly satisfying. Um, I go back and read some of my early work and just cringe, but it was absolutely necessary to begin somewhere to not be ashamed. And, um, you know, I think the work of any critic is to grow and refine. And so if anything, that early work, which is so sloppy and clumsy, there is a seed of, of great passion there that has become whatever, you know, whatever it is that I'm, I'm currently going through now. So I'm, I'm grateful for those um, missteps and those early opportunities to um, kind of cut my teeth and learn what it is like to actually write a piece, to revise, to take editorial feedback in a graceful manner and to, to, put, it, um, to put it to good use. Um, So it's just this, it's been a continuation since then. So I came to it late, but I really sort of hit the ground running and I haven't, haven't really looked back since. So with your writing, now that you're, you're out there so much, I think you're one of the best critics around. Do publishers approach you or do you approach publishers? How does that work? Yeah. So I am, um, I am lucky enough now to be getting um, commissions more often than not, which I'm extremely grateful for. I, I certainly know what it feels like to be, um, you know, to have multiple pieces out on um, on pitches and you, you don't know if you're going to get the, the gig or not, if you're going to be able to have that opportunity. So I'd say it's somewhere around the 70-30 range right now, where um, 70% of the time I am getting uh, commissioned to write um, and 30% of the time, and that's especially if it's a book that I don't think is on maybe editor's radars, if it's a, an especially obscure book or um, a book I'm particularly passionate about or a work in translation that they may not be aware of, that's when I'm kind of going out and talking to editors I know and hopefully uh, getting some light shown onto, um, you know, something I value a lot. Um, but yes, it's it's definitely a mix. And it's certainly, I don't want to give a false impression where I think for some of the the best venues in, in the world, I'm not yet getting commissioned for those. Um, I have been, for instance, I've written for the New York Review of Books and I've written for the for the New Yorker. Neither of those were um, were commissions. That was me pitching and they were aware of me, but it was more like I still had to um, plead my case as it were. And, and um, you know, the pitches were accepted, but it's, I'm hoping that that, you know, I, I'm hoping that that continues. And um, the more I sort of establish myself and the particular, let's say lane or path that I've chosen, which is fiction and translation or um, sort of more, serious or difficult art fiction. I think if I'm known for anything, it's that. I'm, I, I hope that differentiates me enough and the quality of my work is good enough where I'll continue getting those um, those commissions that I value so highly. Having both of us two young children at home all the time, could you tell us a bit more about your writing process, how you, how you get things done? Because your work is so well researched and so well edited and put together. How do you get time to do it all? Yeah, uh, it's it's tough. Um, you know, as, as we've talked about previously, I have I do have a day job and and the family life. Um, you know, I it's primarily writing in the morning and writing at night. So I do get up quite early in the morning. Uh, I write for two or three hours every single day, uh, even you know weekends. I I never miss a day, and it's something I I value so much. And I I have to 
give a shout out to my wife, my wonderful wife, Carla, who allows me and gives me time to do this. I could do nothing without, without her. Um, so it's, you know, it's 5.30 or 6 in the morning until I start my day job. And then I will, um, after the family has gone to sleep at night, after bedtime, I will usually get in another hour, um, hour and a half. Um, and sometimes that's fiction. Sometimes that's nonfiction if I'm on deadline for a piece, but I, I never miss a day. And it's, I find it a very energizing way to start, um, you know, to start the day off. With your fiction, I'm really excited about this because you've told me that you've got an upcoming novel that you're almost finished writing. Could you tell us a bit about it? Yes. Yes. So um, it is, uh, I think if, if you follow me at all and you know what I'm into, you'll be able to, um, I think, recognize some of the touch points, some of the, the writers that I'm drawing on, which would be Thomas Bernhard and Krasna Horkai and, um, you know, a, a range of European and Latin American uh, uh, novelists that I admire. But the, the basics of the story is that um, the, the narrator is a, a psychotherapist named Joao Antunes from Lisbon. Um, he is this sort of petty, puffed up, permanently angry um, man who feels slighted in his profession. Um, he idolizes someone in, in his profession named Dr. Enrique Panameros. He only calls him by his full name throughout the novel. Um, and he feels like this man does not know who he is, uh, does not give him the time of day. And he has a signature therapy, which he calls ambivalence. And he has this patient that he's trying to put through the process of ambivalence so that this doctor whom he idolizes will actually recognize, um, will recognize him as a, as a leading thinker in, in the uh, psychotherapeutic industry. This, this uh, man that he's seeing, his name is Hoffman. Um, he is uh, you know, going through varied sort of stacked overlapping neuroses. Um, his father has recently killed himself. His father was a, a famous novelist who um, told, told his son that inside of his own mind, there were a series of interlocking rooms late 19th century rooms that he could visit when he wanted to, when he wanted to think about an element of his novel. And this, his son named Hoffman believes that he has now been able to visit the rooms and the rooms within his father's, his dead father's mind. And so Joao, the, the psychotherapist is sort of trying to unravel this um, metaphysical mystery that's going on with his patient while all the while trying to put forth the results of this detective work um, in, a, in a clinical study format with uh, his, his colleagues and with Dr. Enrique Penameros uh, to again, sort of prove himself in the world when he feels like no one has recognized him for anything. So it's a lot, it's very nested. There are a series of sort of nested narrators in the manner of Thomas Bernhard. Um, it does have some of his momentum and speed in terms of the obsession of the monologue. Um, but I do think it's, it's also my own, I hope. And so uh, nearing the end of that, and I, I hope, you know, I hope, Agents are interested. I hope publishers are interested, and um, hopefully we can get that in people's hands eventually. And, and you can all let me know what you think. What was your motivation for writing about a character from Lisbon? He's he, he's from Lisbon, um, but he's actually living in the states. Um, my, so my wife is Portuguese. So there is um, there isn't. We almost um, named our son Joao, or almost gave him that middle name. We we didn't end up doing that, but. Um, you know, her, her family is from the Azores. Uh, they've been to Lisbon, you know, often and are very familiar with it. I myself have taken sort of a crash course in the language and the culture since um, marrying. And I'm, I'm very interested in the place, you know, some of its literary forebears like, like a Pessoa. Um, uh, and it, it just, it felt right at the time. You know, it, it, I didn't think about it too much. It's sort of just this person appeared to me as, as a Portuguese man. Um, and I just sort of uh, trusted my intuition and went from there. That's so interesting. Well, I can't wait to read that when that comes out because I'm sure it will. Let's have a chat about what draws you into a book or an author. Yeah, I, I, so I don't think it's one thing. I think it's, um, it can be any number of things. I, I would say if there is um, a through line, it would be a certain amount of ambiguity or, or nuance. If, if there's one thing that to me absolutely destroys art, it's didacticism or the feeling that I am being spoken to in a particular way, or it's it's trying, this, the art piece is trying to teach me something or push me in, in the direction one way or another. I That repulses me, not, not just in fiction, but in film or in painting, um, it, it really any form of art. And so I want to be drawn into a world um, that is elusive to me and that is in some sense um, unstable. 
and that instability is cultivated by the author. And that doesn't mean that they are not in control and then they do not know what they're doing. On the contrary, I think only the greatest writers can truly create and cultivate a sense of um, total instability or total nuance or total ambiguity. Um, and so when, once I feel that aura sort of taking shape in as I'm reading in my, my reading brain, um, there is my critical faculties start working because then you feel like you're in an infinite field of, of possible interpretation. Um, and that's what's most exciting to me as a critic, not when the obvious, um, uh, not, you, you know, not, you know, plot summation or um, when you feel pushed in a particular analytical direction, but when, as in the manner of when you're reading, let's say Gerald Murnane, who I'll have more to say about later, I feel, um, sort of utterly lost, but it's exhilarating. I, I don't mean lost, like I don't know what's going on. I, I just mean I'm in this expansive world that he has created um, and I can choose what direction I wanna go in. I can choose what to think about. And it clearly is not the only direction. My, my essay or piece will be one small sliver of what is possible and what an incredible feeling. Um, and that to me is what drives me on and, and keeps me going is that search for that perfect sense of ambiguity that sort of unlocks critical potential. I think that's one of my favorite things about your writing. You seem to be able to find a whole lot of treasures from different places that we otherwise wouldn't find. Do you see a trend with small publishing and indie publishers that we're getting a bit more exposure to some of these kind of texts? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think um, not only, you know, the great indie publishers and thank God, what would we do without them, but also um, the incredible booksellers who hand sell these these works and build community within um, indie bookstores across America and, and indeed the world. They are um, doing the absolute essential work. And, you know, I'm thankful and, and, and grateful to be um, in contact with so many of those publishers, um, you know, uh, the, the Two Lines Presses and the Archipelagos and the New Directions and the NYRB Classics of the World and many more that I'm not mentioning. Um, so I get a lot of galleys so I get a chance to check out these works early um, but also they are often the first sort of evangelists for for these works um, they are doing they're helping making my life very very much easier I would say um, in terms of placing these works in front of me drawing my attention to them so that I can in turn hopefully write something that compels others to check them out so I do feel like uh, it's this small community but it's extraordinarily passionate and articulate um, and I feel like they would do anything for literature. Um, and I, I feel like it's in good hands. The only thing for us to do is to continue to evangelize, to welcome people, to try these books out because they're, they're truly life-changing. And the wonderful thing about them, which I'm sure you've experienced, is once, once you find one, they naturally create uh, other sort of through lines to different authors or scenes or international literatures where it's each one is a ramp into this incredible world um, and they're all connected. They're nodes in this massive network that we're all working with us who are passionate about literature sort of slowly working through. Um, and that too is exhilarating and um, is almost a religious feeling uh, for, for me to think about the um, expansiveness and the infinitude of, of, of great literature. That's, that's very exciting, uh, exciting to me. Are there a few particular publishers that you are really passionate about supporting? Because like I know like people like Fitzcarraldo and uh, New Directions and Pushkin and a lot of these places that are doing work in translation and work that you don't see anywhere else. Who do you find that, you know, you'd, you'd basically pick up a book on the basis of its publisher? Yeah, I mean, not to alienate the other the other fantastic publishers that I work with, but you, you mentioned, I mean, New Directions to me is just the, the standard bearer. I think um, just going back, decades too. I mean, their backlog is just incredible. Their back catalog, it, you can throw a dart and find um, this little gem that you've never heard of, um, or at least I, I've never heard of. So I would say for me, New Directions is sort of uh, at the vanguard of, of all of this. But with that said, I mean, you know, some of the other ones I, I just mentioned, I think, um, you know, NYRB Classics, just an incredible curatorial eye for what they're doing. Um, so, much, so much of the time, I don't know the author at all. Um, I like to think of myself as somewhat well-read and often I'm just, I had never heard of this individual before. Um, but, you know, Archipelago, I think, does incredible work. Um, Two Lines Press does incredible work. Um, 
uh, gosh, who, who, who am I forgetting? I know I'm forgetting others. Uh, and Other Stories is another one I've been reading a, a, a ton of lately. Um, so yeah, there. I know I'm forgetting others. I'm gonna feel really bad about it. But yes, uh, th there are, again, there's this sort of vanguard of publishers that I trust um, to educate me and to keep those galleys coming, to keep giving me ideas and material to, um, to exercise the criticism I love to write. And, and I truly don't know what I would do without them. You know, they're doing the Lord's work out there for sure. With writers like Bolaño who have now come to such prominence, I think in a, in a much wider sense, uh, and people like even Krasna Harkai, who seems to have got a mainstream following at the moment, do you find there are other authors out there who you think really deserve that kind of, you know, that following and obviously the financial benefits of that? Yeah, I, well, unfortunately, I was just going to mention two dead, two dead authors who I feel like uh, deserve a, a, a much uh, wider, wider reading audience. Um, actually, one that's still alive, um, and she's, I feel like I'm going to talk about her in a moment, but um, Flor Yegi is someone, and she's, she's still with us, and um, I feel like the tide is, is turning a little bit. I, I feel like she came to, her translations came much later in her life, um, but a lot of critical attention is beginning to be given to her with very good reason. So she would probably be one of my, and she's top of mind for me because I'm actually writing a piece on her right now. But as someone who's still alive and writing incredible work, um, she is certainly one of them. I'd say the other one is um, Antonio Lobo Antunes, the, the Portuguese uh, novelist. He is, I would say he's quite well known, but I don't think he's nearly well known enough. In fact, I, I have to thank, um, Mauro Javier Cardenas, who introduced him to me. Um, and I've just been going through his books and they are just masterful. I mean, it's it's the kind of thing you wait for, a discovery like that, at least for me. So um, those two would probably, along with Mernane, are, are, are my um, favorite living novelists, I would say. Um, in terms of those who have passed on, but who, who do not have a, a big enough audience in my, in my estimation, Wolfgang Hilbig is one that I think uh, could be due for um, a pretty massive jump in 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 audience. Um, he has a, a novel forthcoming uh, in, in English called The Interim uh, this fall from uh, Two Lines Press, and I'm very excited about that one. I may be doing a speaking event with a couple of other writers on uh, Hillbig, which I'm really excited about, and I will definitely be writing about that book. And then also the Luminous novel uh, by Mario Livrero, um, a Uruguayan uh, novelist who passed in 2004, um, really incredible sort of writer of almost like an anti-literature, just um, not quite autofiction, but just also not tr completely avoids plot is just like almost pure digression and anxiety um, and <laughs> neuroses, but really funny. Um, and I, I, I don't know how to explain him. I have a, I have a piece coming out in the New Left Review on Levero shortly that uh, I will be excited to share, but I think he's someone who's just I, like, I feel like the Latin American literary puzzle is incomplete without Livrero. And for me, that was a, a missing piece. And now I'm, there's only two novels uh, in English of his so far, but I think hopefully with these two, we'll be getting a lot more, um, you know, translated. This one by Annie McDermott, who did an incredible job. Let's talk about Gerald Manane for a minute. I know he's someone that we would both like to see have a much bigger audience. I, I adore Mernane. I mean, like I said, I, I would say Mernane and Tunej and, and Krasnorkai are my, my three favorite living uh, novelists. Um, my worry with uh, Mernane is, is almost that he'll become this um, respectable institution, which sort of robs him of the deep strangeness uh, and, and almost, you know, alienation of his work that I love so much. Um, I don't want him to become a respected literary institution. I almost, I, I want people to enjoy him, but I want them to think of him as a dangerous artist and not as a, as an institution, if you will. So, um, you know, I, he's one that I almost don't feel prepared to write about him yet. There, there are a few others. Um, John Hawks is one that I wanted to talk about a little bit later on. Um, but there are novels I respect so much and whose work has meant so much to me that I almost feel like I'm, I'm still approaching that limit point where I'll actually be able to articulate what I want to say about them. And Murnane is one where um, if I ever do write about him, I will know that it's the right time that I have finally, I don't know, read and reread all of his works enough to say what I, what I need to say about him. Um, but he's mystifying and, um, 
you know, one of the, uh, I, I think one of the absolute greatest pro stylists in, in English, certainly living and and I would say all time. Mm. I recently read, uh, I think it's his first book, A Life on the Clouds, which is actually mm-hmm. a really good entry point for him. And it is, it's, it's like Portnoy's complaint funny. It is, it is a really funny, entertaining book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And his, his, I think his books got gradually a, a bit more, um, estranging over time. I mean, there's, there's, they're almost semi sort of, I don't want to say standard realist, but some of those early, some, a couple of his early novels, especially when he was still developing, I think as a literary artist, they aren't particularly, you know, experimental or um, they don't tap into some of those infinite grassland dream worlds, uh, the fractal paddocks of his later work. Um, uh, they, but it's a, it's a gentle slope into, into the deeper, I think more metaphysical mornane of, of the mature years. But yeah, even the early stuff is, is incredible. Let's take a quick break here on Beyond the Zero. We're talking with Dustin Illingworth. This episode of Beyond the Zero is brought to you by TikTok and the Chinese Communist Party. Join us now. Welcome back. We're talking to Dustin Illingworth. And Dustin, are you ready to talk about your To Be Read pile and what you're currently reading? Yes. Yes, I am. Um, so I, I mentioned Fleur Yegi earlier. Um, she, I've got her whole stack here. Uh, so I've got, you know, the water statues is the one forthcoming from New Directions. Um, that is, I'm going to be writing a sort of a comprehensive piece, I hope, uh, on her and her oeuvre. Um, but it'll be sort of focused on on this one, the water statues, which I actually find to be maybe my favorite. I was already a huge fan and I'm really loving the poetic nature of this one. It's, it's very strange. Um, it isn't quite as icy um, and precise and crystalline as some of her other fictions, um, but I'm, I'm just loving it. So I've got water statues. I've got These Possible Lives, I Am the Brother of XS, XX, Last Vanities, SS Proletarka, and Sweet Days of Discipline. Um, rereading all of those other than the water statues, but that's on my, my nightstand table at the moment. Um, speaking of Mernane, I do have his stream system, which is uh, his collected short fiction. Basically, that's always that's always on my to be read to be read pile. I'm constantly reading and rereading um, these stories. Um, I recently mentioned on Twitter that I thought "When the Mice Failed to Arrive" uh, is my my favorite short story in in the English language. It's it's certainly top two or three for me, if not number one. Um, so whenever I feel sort of depleted, or if I've read something that hasn't really taken me anymore, anywhere or lived up to a particular standard, I will return and read a story from, from Stream System and be, again, sort of quenched in a way that only um, Mernane can offer. Um, I am re- I'm reading uh, Carol Masso's Ava, um, which is a Dalkey archive work, and I, I feel like it's a, it's a precursor to sort of the fragment novel that is sort of experiencing a vogue at the moment um, and, and, and has, to be honest, in years past as well. But this was written in 1993. Um, it is about a 39 year old woman. It's the last day of her life. She has cancer and she's um, lying in hospital and thinking back over uh, her 39 years. And it's um, very rapturous. It's like a piece of music um, and it is it is fr- completely fragmented. So you're constantly sort of trying to orient yourself, but you're just treated to these flashes of, uh, you know, great beauty, references to other bits of art that she's experienced, interpersonal relationships, sexual ecstasy, you know, beauty in the natural world. Um, and it just makes this really lovely braided quilting effect of, of experience and observation um, it, that really suits the fragment novel. I'm actually somewhat anti-fragment novel. That's a topic for maybe a different show, but um, this is, this one works uh, because it's sort of, the formal experiment and how it ties to her disintegrating mind, it really, it, it works. Um, so I, I love it. Um, and then last but not least, including a piece of nonfiction in here, another one that I've had on my um, nightstand for some time, I've, I've, I've read it before and I'm constantly rereading it. It's Hugh Kenner's The Pound Era. Um, it's probably my favorite book of literary criticism um, alongside Elizabeth Hardwick's collected uh, essays. Um, it's a it's sort of a, an origin story of modernism of literary modernism that's focused on on Ezra Pound but also intersects with um, you know Joyce and, and numerous other figures from the era but consistently surprising he it's written like a novel with sort of the 
I don't know, the, the, the verbal stylings and the daring of, of a great work of modernism. He almost matches his source material, who he's writing about. Um, and it's total, it's exhaustive. It's just a, an incredible overhead view of how, moder how modernism came about and various tendrils and how it extended um, up to about mid-century. So it's a beautiful book. I recommend it to any aspiring critic. Um, I can learn from it every single time I open it. So it's just really wonderful. With your commission pieces, is there anything interesting you're currently working on? Yeah, so um, I mentioned Mario Lavero, um, the Luminous novel. That was one that I got commissioned. I'm very excited to share. I'm, I'm turning in my final edits there, so that, that should be out fairly shortly. Um, I have a piece on Robert Valser coming out with The New Yorker um, on his the, the recent um, biography, um, but also kind of looks back uh, through his entire uh, writing career, such as it was. I'm, I'm very excited to share that one. I have the Flor Yegi piece, and then I do plan on writing on um, Wolfgang Hilbig's The Interim later this year. I know I've already mentioned that one, but that's the other one that I'm really looking forward to. Antonio Di Benedetto, uh, the second novel in his, um, his uh, trilogy of expectation, it's called The Silentiary. That was supposed to be out this fall, but I just discovered actually right before I got on the call with you that it's been delayed until um, early 2022. So that one will have to wait. I'm an enormous Zalma fan. It's one of my all time favorite novels. And so we'll definitely be writing on that one when it comes out, but it's gonna be put in the next year. So is Zama part of that trilogy or is this a separate one? It is. Zama okay. was the first. Uh, I don't know the name of, of the third, to be honest. Um, I, I've been looking for that just, just recently, actually, just today, um, but I can't find it. But apparently it's, yeah, the, the Silentiary will be the, the second of the, of the three. Sounds exciting. Can't wait for yeah. that one. Are you ready to move on to your top 10? Yes, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. To begin with, uh, so let me just sort of add a caveat to this where I feel like my top 10 is fairly fluid. You know, I, I talk to a lot of my writer friends and they have sort of a, some of them have a fairly set in stone list where these are the absolute unmovable top 10. And I love that. Like that's great loyalty and they know exactly what they love and, and believe that it will be there forever. For me, you could ask me this next month and there might be a little bit of movement uh, in one or two of them. So it, this reflects sort of my current state of mind, what I'm kind of currently obsessed with. And um, they would all be in the same ballpark, but there may be there may be some movement. I just wanted to mention that. With that said, the, the top three for me have remained the top three for really as long as I can remember since I, I've been a serious reader, I would say. So the first one would be Malcolm Lowry's Under the Volcano. That's, that's my favorite novel of all time. Um, that I don't see that one getting knocked off. It perhaps it, it could. It's it's actually my hope that it will. I hope I find another novel as great. Um, you know, there's this quote that I love from Michael Hoffman, who is my favorite critic. Um, and uh, my favorite critic, you know, reviewing my favorite novel, what a dream. Um, but he says, under the volcano eats light like a black hole. It is a work of such gravity and connectedness and spectroscopic richness that it is more world than product. It is absolute mass, agglomeration of consciousness and experience and terrific personal grace. It has planetary swagger. It is a planet dancing. And I think a planet dancing is such a wonderful description of, um, of that novel. It's, it's hugeness and it's, it's beauty and it's terror. Um, it's just, it's incredible. Uh, I, I've read, I think I've read it eight times and I will continue to do so hopefully until, you know, till the end of my life. It is one of the most visceral and terrifying books that I've ever read. It's it's unrelenting, you know. Even right right from the big beginning, it just takes you to this edge and forces you to look sort of down into the abyss. And and then but and then you keep expecting there to be a, a release and tension. And just if anything, it ratchets up throughout. So yeah, really incredible. Um, second, another great work of literary modernism, uh, Virginia Woolf's uh, *To the Lighthouse*. Um, this is like the most I don't know, intimate and special novel for me because I feel like um, I feel like this novel has aged with me. You know, I first read it in my early twenties, and I know I know all books do that to some extent. Um, you know, they they change for you as you age. But To the Lighthouse seems to always be moving out ahead of me as I live and I go through my life, and it it darkens. You know, it darkens like wood almost over time, and 
it becomes roomier and it, it offers me more grace and understanding and mystery as I, you know, became a father or became a husband or had deaths in my life or um, understood a part of my life or, or ceased understanding a part of my life. I felt like I could find a touch point or reflection of that experience in this book. And, and it allowed me to um, deepen or enrich my own perspective on the matter. And so I'm almost sort of excited to find out what this will bring me in my, you know, in my 40s, in my 50s, in my 60s, because um, it is a novel that almost feels like a companion. Um, and I'm very grateful for, for that. Um, so yeah, To the Lighthouse, number two. Number three, um, is Ulysses. <laughs> um, you know, nothing really, nothing more needs to be said about this, this book, I feel like. Um, I do think that even though it's, it's number three on my list, I, I consider this the greatest novel of all time. Uh, it's not my favorite novel of all time, but, um, you know, the possibility of discovering another Ulysses or, or, you know, being alive when another Ulysses is written is one of the reasons why I continue to read. Um, I've read it through twice. I read it once at school and I've read it once since then. And now I find myself just opening, um, especially opening to the early passages and the early chapters of, um, you know, Nestor and Proteus and um, just the incredible richness of the language, the formal dexterity, it's all there and it's, it's pristine. And it's this absolute sense of, uh, of, of time that has somehow been restrained onto a page and it's, it's enmeshed in consciousness um, and there's there's no one who does it better and there's nothing else like the book so I know it gets a lot of sort of shit talked on it now because it's supposedly pretentious or no one's actually read Ulysses or whatever and that's that's all garbage it's um, you know the masterpiece of English language literature and I think every serious reader should should read it at least once it's interesting you've chosen that and uh, and under the volcano as well it's like two books that occur on one day and uh, they're both completely different and and somehow have so many things in common absolutely no that's a great point i didn't even think about that but i think there is something about that dilation and ex, you know extension of time um it's weird it's like you're the you're constrained by that 24-hour period the author is but somehow they find ways to sort of place in infinities within that that time frame and that's um that's beautiful and sort of electric and i i love i love when when novelists are able to do that um and speaking of my my Number four is um, Bolaño's 2666, um, which to me is the great, greatest novel of the 21st century. Um, it still feels like the future of fiction to me. It feels like it's glancing back at me as I read it often. Um, you know, it's surreal, it's menacing, it's very funny, it's terrifying. And there is this sense of um, post-national porousness that still feels so real to me. And, and again, so terrifying where, the, the demarcations and the borders are breaking down, not only among nations, but among people and phenomenon and um, uh, where, where you'll slip through, where, you'll, where you will arrive to when you slip through that porousness, you're never exactly certain. And I feel like that's sort of what it, what it feels like to be alive now, or at least that's how I often feel. And I think Bolaño caught that like 20 years early. So um, an incredible book. Savage Detectives is also very high for me, um, but I, I just included this one on this list. I have to say 2666 is a, it's a masterpiece. If you haven't read it, go out and read it. I don't think, I think I have to agree with you on that, that it's probably the best book uh, this century so far. I do hope something exceeds it at some point, but at the moment I would say that that is by far and away number one. Yes, agreed. I have a couple of different versions and I know this is just going to be audio, but this one has, a, I have Natasha Wimmer, the incredible translator. I have her um, signature on the, on the inside cover of this one, which is sort of a nice little treat. Um, I keep this one on, I have a beat up version that I read and this one stays sort of on the, on the shelf in general. I've um, got, I have three versions too. I've got a soft okay. cover, hard cover, and I've got the three volume set. Nice. Got me beat. That's great. <laughs> Um, number five for me is uh, Moby Dick. I still have my old beat up Signet classic here. Um, I feel like this is the great American novel. You know, I, I know that, that again, that that's sort of looked down upon as a, as a phrase or a concept now, but I truly believe this, this is it. The kind of discussion for me is closed and has been for a long time. Um, and the critic, uh, James Wood, who wrote this incredible essay on, on Moby Dick for um, the New Republic, he calls the book an insanity of metaphor. 
And um, I, I love that description. And there's this sense throughout that um, Melville is trying to fill this inscrutable silence, which may be God's silence with the endless sort of linkages and, and cascades of language uh, that he finds uh, and, and sort of enacts in through metaphor. Um, and it's this total literary madness. I mean, it's it's really wild where he takes the language and what the, the kinds of leaps that he allows himself. Um, and it, it's it's the most incredible work, I think, of, a, of American literature, certainly. And it's one that, I, again, that I can open up to almost any chapter and find something that sort of refreshes my understanding of what fiction can do and what language can do. So definitely, definitely recommend it. Um, up next is Satan Tango, number six. Uh, Krasnorka, I think this is sort of the, the place to start. It's where I started uh, for him. So if anyone is curious about sort of dipping their toe in or if they'll like him or not, I think this is a, a fine starting point. It has all of the sort of defining features of his work, um, you know, obscurity and playfulness and pessimism, tendency towards apocalypse, um, uh, obsessive monologues. Uh, but it's this absolute work of just total commitment, um, work of genius. I've written on him for the Paris Review, if anyone's interested in sampling that as well, where I, I hope I give a, a reasonable overview of, of what to expect. But one of our greatest living writers, and um, he's constantly writing more. I mean, there's another novel that I think is in, um, Trans, it's being worked on in translation right now, which should be coming out the next couple of years, which I'm so excited to read. Um, and a new one is coming from New Directions actually called Finding uh, Chasing Homer, Chasing Homer. And it has QR codes built into the text. So he's always sort of pushing uh, into worlds of multimedia as well, which is very interesting. Um, and it's just another thing I love about him. Um, number seven for me, we have already talked about him a bit, but it's, it's Gerald Murnane's The Plains. Um, you know, don't need to go too deep into this since we already did chat about him, but I think what I love about this book, part one of the many things I love about it is how the supposed provincialism of the Plainsmen is in itself just this kind of act, and it obscures their, their real passion and their ritual and their cosmology, and, um, uh, you know, I, I think there's this, um, line Ben Lerner wrote about the novel, and he says, for, for Murnane, for the Plainsmen, this apparent richness of the actual is a kind of poverty. This apparent richness of the actual is a kind of poverty. And I love that line. And I, I think a lot of great fiction stems from that insight. And certainly a lot of um, Murnane's great fiction stems from that insight where it's only in the imagined or the possible where the true richness of literature and of life uh, exists. And that's frankly a magical thought and a magical place to be taken to and a terrifying place to be taken to. Um, okay, number eight for me is going to be uh, John Hawks, The Lime Twig. Um, you know, I think he is this too little red American genius. New Directions, again, are doing incredible work. They have most of his, most of his great works, I would say, are under the New Directions banner. You can find um, all of them. The Lime Twig for me is, though, the, the epitome of that immaculate John Hawks prose style, where it's, it's, it's very thick, it's very oppressive, and it, it excuse me, it feeds into this sort of aura of violence and, and horror um, that is somehow paradoxically incredibly beautiful. Um, it's the darkest sort of sludgiest beauty that I've discovered outside of maybe Hilbig in, in, um, in prose. Um, and he's another writer that, again, I don't feel, I will write a piece on John Hawk someday, but I'm still, I feel like I'm still reading and rereading him to get to a point where I've assimilated all of my feelings and thoughts on what he's done. But he is um, just incredibly important to me. And I hope, I hope there are other champions that will carry him forward because I feel like he should be talked about uh, so much more than he is given how many masterpieces he wrote. He's written quite a few books. They're all, none of them are terribly long. But he doesn't seem to get the love of a, you know, of a William Gass or a Gaddis or a, you know, even a Pinchon or someone like that. Absolutely. And he palled around with those guys. You know, he was definitely part of that kind of cohort. And they were, they like William Gass has written lovingly about him so many times. And he was a great champion of, of Hawks. But it doesn't seem to have really created that interest in uh, among readers. I think there is a certain group um, of which you and I might be members where, you, you know, you, you've heard of him or you've sought him out and you've read him and, and, and adore him. But I, 
I mean, I feel like he should be core to American fiction. People who are studying American fiction, he should be right up there alongside um, the other greats. Um, and I, I don't think he is yet. He's still far too obscure in my, in my opinion. Moving along here, um, number nine, I have Miss Lonely Hearts by Nathaniel West, um, which to me is this, you know, this great um, atheistic, skeptical, pessimistic work of American modernism, perhaps the most pessimistic work of American modernism. Um, but he's such an incredible writer that he's able to elicit some kind of sympathy even for um, the most hateful of his characters, which takes, you know, obviously it takes incredible skill and, and insight. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's just this incredibly bleak novel that because it's so carefully and painfully observed somehow sort of exalts you in the reading of it, which is so hard to do and something I really um, admire and look for in novels where that element of observation um, ennobles tragedy and, and, and can carry us up into realms uh, otherwise impossible. And then last but not least, number 10 for me, eh, I had to get a Thomas Bernhard book on there. It's gonna be Old Masters. For me, it's it's the funniest and most complete, I think of Bernhard's novels. Um, I'm also a, a huge fan of the Lime Works, but um, for me, I think Old Masters is the most, the most complete and accomplished. Um, and I think it's interesting. I just wrote about this for The Baffler. I wrote a piece about Bernhard, um, but I think a lot of contemporary novelists that I admire are sort of Bernhardt's children, you know, and it's it's interesting to see how, to one extent or another, this ranting obsessive style is transmuted into all of these different novelists and novels. And you you can trace them back to Bernhardt, but of course everyone puts their own stamp on it. And it's such a, a flexible um, style, um, you know, th that that anger and that um, that outrage can be uh, applied to so many aspects of life. Um, both the extremely personal and the extremely public. And so it's, I think he is here to stay. I think he has sort of entered the DNA of, of an international literature because he's been so well translated. It's not just a matter of German literature or Austrian literature. It's a matter of world literature now. He belongs to everyone. I'm always surprised how funny his work is. Like it's got an absurdist streak to it. It's got a, there's a, there's an element where there is a lot of humor and a lot of real seriousness at the same time. I think it's, it's funny because it's it's not like a lot of other work. Like I know there's a lot of, you know, people who are writing in his style, but I think his work is still so unique and, and so different. Totally. Yeah. I mean, he's he's often imitated and and never really quite they never really quite capture what what is at the heart of what he's trying to do. Um somehow he, yeah, he takes he has that acceleration where from literally the first word, first sentence, you are taken to this feverish place of outrage. And you'd think, you know, the novels are fairly short, but you'd think 150 to 200 pages of that would become tiresome or, you know, it would become a shtick or repetitive in some sense. But you are, like you said, laughing or um, crying or taken to, a, you know, the furthest edge of his outrage. You're, you're there right in lockstep with him the whole time and he holds your, your attention. And um, yeah, I don't know. He, I think outrage is an important part of like the modern... Um, the modern sense of, of being human, the modern human condition, I think anger is, is only natural given what's going on in the world at any given time. Um, and the alienation one feels in, in front of one's labor or um, relations to the rest of the world. So I think he was way ahead and he still has the most definitive blueprint about um, you know anger and outrage and how that can be used almost in a righteous sense, but never so that you never so that you feel righteous in the usage of it. What a great list that was. That's probably the first time I've heard people talk about so many books that I think would appear in my top 10, in their top 10. Oh, that's great. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad. I, I feel like, um, I, I don't know, I feel like at least for, for the people who like know who I am or follow me on Twitter, they feel like I only like really, really, really obscure stuff. And I, I certainly do. But I mean, I try, you know, when it comes down to it, my favorite books are somewhat well-known, at least in, in our little corner of the literary universe. Um, so really appreciate the chance to talk through that. Um, it's been a few years since I've actually tried to sit down and write out a top 10, and it's definitely changed um, since the last one I wrote. But uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to think through. It's a good challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Before we go, can you tell our listeners where we can find you and keep up with all of your work? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm very active in, you know, quote unquote, literary Twitter, uh, whatever that means. Um, uh, at D.D. Illingworth is, is my 
uh, name there. Um, you can follow me there. I write um, literary essays pretty regularly for um, New York Times, The New Yorker, um, The Nation, New York Review of Books. Um, you know, my, my work is out there and I, I tend to write quite a bit. So there's a, always an essay um, on these kinds of works that we're talking about coming out about one every month or every other month. Um, and then I also have, I have a website, destinylingworth.com. And then I have a, a sub stack, which I think might be of more interest to your listeners, which sort of deals with what we're talking about. It's, it's, it's about anti-realism, which is broad and sort of an unfair moniker to give it. I'm not even really an anti-realist. It's just sort of like it gives me an enemy to position myself against in the weird little books that I like to write about and think about. Um, but I do write about um, what I see as um, books that have not gotten enough love, experimental works or adventurous works. And I also write more broadly about um, fiction, uh, the form of fiction, um, you know, experimental fiction. And um, I'm hopefully going to adapt that into a book eventually. That would be my my next step after um, finishing this novel. So if you're interested, sign up and, and check it out. Well, thanks so much for joining us on Beyond the Zero, Dustin. Hope we can talk again soon. Okay, sounds real good. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thanks again to Dustin Illingworth. You can find us at Beyond Zero Pod on Twitter and you can email us at beyondthezeropod at gmail.com. We'll see you for your next episode next Friday.